You keep hearing about containers, and maybe you have even used Docker in production. Now it's time to move beyond Docker. In today's episode of Software Engineering Daily, Steve Pusty talks about OpenShift, a platform from Red Hat that helps engineers leverage the power of containers and the DevOps harmony of microservices. To hear these buzzwords, you can always listen to Software Engineering Daily. But to see these buzzwords demonstrated in live presentations, the 2016 O'Reilly Fluent Conference is coming up March 8th through 10th in San Francisco, and you can get a chance to win a free ticket by tweeting at us about your favorite episode of Software Engineering Daily. There are more pieces of information about this in the show notes. At Fluent, Steve Pusty will be presenting how to run and manage Docker-based applications in production, which is one of the things we talked about in today's episode of Software Engineering Daily. We also explored how engineers are working with sysadmins better these days, and where the future of platform as a service will look like. But first, let's hear from the sponsors that make Software Engineering Daily possible. Engineers are always looking to simplify. To simplify testing and deployment, engineers turn to CodeShip. CodeShip is continuous integration and delivery as a service. With CodeShip, your tests are executed against your code automatically whenever you push to GitHub or Bitbucket. On Software Engineering Daily, we've done several shows about DevOps, and continuous deployment is key to DevOps. It's a great way to break down the wall of confusion between development and operations. Managing your own testing infrastructure is painful. That's why you want a service like CodeShip to do it for you. If you have a huge number of tests, you can use CodeShip's Parallel CI to run all your tests in parallel. CodeShip will spin up containers on their own infrastructure to run your tests in parallel. If the code passes your tests, CodeShip will deploy it automatically to your users. Companies like Product Hunt are already using CodeShip to speed up and simplify development. To sign up for free and start shipping today, go to CodeShip.com, or to try out CodeShip's new Docker platform, go to CodeShip.com slash Docker. Steve Pusty is a developer advocate with Red Hat. Steve, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks. It's great to be here. You have talked about the unfortunate long-running war between developers and sysadmins. What drives the difference in perspective between devs and ops or sysadmins? Uh, Oh, I think part of what that's caused by, I mean, part is because they usually sit in different areas, right? So I think part of it is um, in most organizations, even like I used to work at Yale University and the sysadmins would sit in one space and we, the developers, would sit in a completely different space. So I think that is actually part of what drives it. I I think that's one of the things I like about microservices is microservices, when done right, actually includes a sysadmin person. And so everybody has to sit together and work together all the time. It's not like I chuck it over the wall, that kind of thing. But then I think the other thing is the tasks that and the goals of each team. I think for developers, they usually want to roll things out fast because they have the end users asking them for constant updates. They want new things. They want there's a bug, fix it now, right? And I think, so they have an emphasis on quick and easy for them to develop with. And I think on the other hand, for sysadmins, they're used to running things like Oracle rack clusters or email servers, where email servers should never, ever go down, right? And if the rack cluster goes down, the whole company is in a panic because they can't do any of the financials and all that stuff. So their emphasis is on things that are rock solid, and just keep going no matter what's happening. And if, if it's working, don't mess with it, right? Because then everybody's fine. Like you only mess with it if there's a security vulnerability. Um, and even then it's staged. It's not like, oh, immediately we're going to fix it. So I think that difference in goals actually leads the group into conflict because the developers are always asking for new and fast things. And the sysadmins are like, well, we want to test it. We want to keep it nice and slow. There's why are we doing this? Because it wasn't broken. We need a controlled process. And developers are less so. So Mm -hmm. I think that's a part of the problem. So in this episode, we're going to get into infrastructure as a service and platform as a service and why platform as a service is useful for resolving the types of problems that devs and ops people encounter. But I'd like to level set for people who don't know what these terms mean. Could you define infrastructure as a service and platform as a service? 
Sure. I mean, I think there's some, there's still some differences in definitions in the community. I'll give you mine. And I think this is, from what I've seen, this is kind of the majority opinion. So infrastructure as a service, the biggest infrastructure as a service provider out there is Amazon Web Services, right? So with infrastructure as a service, it's exactly like the name says, you ask for infrastructure as a service. So just like with Amazon Web Services or OpenStack, you would say, I want a server with this much RAM, this much CPU, with this network, this DNS, and it actually usually you don't even get the DNS, you just get an IP address. So you get all that stuff set up and it's spun up almost instantaneously, right? Well, in compared to the old world, which is awesome, but for sysadmins, it's not really so awesome for developers. Um, it's awesome for sysadmins, and it actually still is awesome in a certain way for developers, because we no longer have to wait six months for things to be bought and go back and forth and racked and stacked, and and so that's really great for us. But the problem is for a developer who has an idea and just wants to start getting going on it, they still have to install all the software, keep it up to date, do the DNS stuff. They have to do everything else when they really just wanted to write an application. So platform as a service is a level above infrastructure as a service. Um, I work on OpenShift, which is Red Hat's platform as a service. There's other ones out there. Probably the largest one is Heroku that most people would know about. And the idea with that is the developer, well, I'll talk about what it's like on OpenShift and it's like this on most other ones as well. Uh, the developer says, well, I wanna work with Python and I want Postgres. And they send one command to the platform and a Python server, like an Apache server with mod WSGI and a Postgres server is spun up. There's a Git repo or some source repository. The developer, you know, has a, maybe a requirements.txt or an Apache, in a Java example, they would have a Maven file with all the dependencies. They put that in the Git repo. They put their source code in the repo. They push that to the platform. The platform takes that, builds it, deploys it. It's already got a URL. It's already got all, all the wiring hooked up. It just runs. And the developer is just working on data and application stuff and not having to think about how do I configure this? And then if there's a security vulnerability, the platform as a service provider actually patches Tomcat or Apache or, um, you know, with Apache like SSL, the Heartbleed, right? Mm. That was in an infrastructure as a service model. You have to go, you as the developer would have to go in and patch all the places and hope that you got it right. Mm. With platform as a service, you would count on the platform provider to actually patch Apache in all the other places that Heartbleed might be affected. Mm. So, so. so you're talking about platform as a service as this layer of usability that sits on top of infrastructure as a service. Um, so with that in mind, why is platform as a service... So you, you touched on this in, in terms of the security vulnerabilities, um, but I think there's also a whole, a whole host of other things that make platform as a service an appealing uh, point of resolution between developers and sysadmins. Could you touch on some of the, uh, the additional points, the additional problems that it solves uh, when thinking about the relationship between dev and ops? Yeah, I mean, so remember, devs wants, wants to do things quickly and they want to get going and they don't want to say, hey, sysadmins, can you spin me up a VM and then wait a couple weeks until or even a couple days until that gets spun up, right? And ops don't want to give root to developers. I mean, that's basically the biggest thing they don't want to do. They also don't want developers configuring things really differently than it's going to be running in production because then there's this whole nightmare of having to translate things. So what happens with platform as a service? And I'll, again, I know OpenShift most, um, that's what I know best. So I'll use that as an example. With OpenShift, what happens is the sysadmins set up the cluster of OpenShift, right? So they set it up, they set the version of Tomcat, they set the version of Apache. They've, in, in the version currently in online that we use our own custom containers in the new version of OpenShift, which will be coming to online uh, sometime this summer, it's all Docker containers. Right? So the system administrator can say, these are the Docker containers I want you to use when you do your development, but you go do whatever development you want. Once that cluster is set up, the developer can then just request resources as they need them. Right, So they get their own playground without having to wait on um, production to do it. And so like a perfect example of this would be somebody like DreamWorks. So every time DreamWorks produces a new movie, they often have a new website with it, right? And so the developers are needing to crank out web, websites regularly at a pretty high cadence compared to most other places and fixing things, right, re relatively quickly. And then it goes away. And so sysadmins don't want to be sitting there spinning up something every time and worrying that what they're actually building won't run in production. So, for example, DreamWorks runs a whole cluster that's all OpenShift, both dev, 
QA and production. So what happens is the devs, they say, for this example, we're going to be serving up a lot of, or for this movie, we're going to be serving up a lot of assets. So we want Node.js. And it's already there in the cluster. So they said, I want Node and I want Mongo. And they get both of those. They start writing their code. They're done. They tell the QA team, hey, we're done. Come test it. Mm. So what happens is the QA team has view privileges into the dev in, into the dev project, and they clone the application, but they put it on containers with more resources available to them, mm. right? And so then they can do all their QA testing on it. If there's a problem, they can push it back to dev and say, "Hey, keep doing it," and they can go, you know, keep iterating that cycle. And then once QA is done and says, "Yeah, this is good to go." Uh, production, the sysadmins, so devs can't push into QA or uh, production, but each level above can see the level behind, right, as the, on the road to production. So production is probably just owned by sysadmins. And what they can do is they can see the QA project that's been passed up and they can say, OK, I'm going to clone that one and now give it even more resources and the DNS entries it's going to get is actually real live production DNS entries. Mm. And so what happened there is you got this nice the devs got to do things quickly without having to talk to product without having to talk to the sysadmins. But the sysadmins knew whatever they were moving along the process was going to run in production because that's what they were running all along. I mean, it doesn't have you can use it all different phases of the life cycle, even if you just used it for dev. What makes it nice for production is still the sysadmins know that everybody's spinning up Tomcat in the same way and their source code is going to probably be structured in the same way. But they can also give them lots of other things to play with and have it sandboxed inside the cluster rather than setting it up individually on each VM that they spin up usually like for a developer and say, oh, well, and then the developer usually needs root because the sysadmin forgets to put something in. Right. And so then they're so it tries to strike a balance between that. I, I mean, in certain cases, with your a platform as a service is not the right answer. Right. Mm. If you're if you're if you're going to need to go in as a developer and play around with firewall rules or you're doing something really funky with networking or you need to install a lot of packages that nobody else needs and they have uh, dependencies in the core system, especially with the older way that doc the containers were done, that's not a good situation. Now, with the move to Docker and Docker containers, that's actually a much more realistic scenario that people can put their own dependencies, build their own Docker images and go from there. Mm -hmm. um, it's we've moved into a the Docker came out. I would say what is it three years ago? About yeah, something like that. Yeah, about three years ago. Uh, containers were around way, way, way before that. Containers, uh, if you know BSD change root jails, those are containers. Right. And for those of us who ever worked with Solaris, Solaris zones. Exactly. Right. So they've been around for a really long time. It's just with what Docker did really right. The container specification was cross platform on Linux, right? And it is it, it lets you do a layered file system so that mm. you can do things like, so there's a uh, one of our customers in Canada who's doing an amazing job of this is there's Docker Hub, right, where everybody can build their own Docker container. And just so we can also level set on this, what Docker is, just so everybody understands the difference between VMs and Docker containers, because I think that's still new to some people. So... With a VM, what you're saying is slice up this operating system and giving the, this virtual machine. It's almost like infrastructure as a service again, right? And so then you install an operating, the entire operating system into it, and then you put all the other pieces you need inside of it, right? And, and one of the things with VMs is they also actually grab all, like when you say, I need four gigs of memory or eight gigs of memory for this VM, it grabs those resources and they're not available to the rest of the machine. Right. Even if your app in there is only using, you know, um, 128 megs of RAM above the operating system, you're still getting whatever the machine was given to you. And so it's actually quite heavy in terms of resource use, especially if you're doing something like microservices or anything in general, app, app development. Um, what happens with Docker is what Docker and containers do is they say, we're going to slice up the actual OS. We're not going to actually give you a new OS. Mm. for everything that you spin up, we're actually just going to slice up the kernel and the OS that's there, and you're going to bring whatever dependencies you need inside the container. And we'll say you can have up to two gigs of RAM, but if you're only using 512 megs of RAM, then that's all you're using. And the only RAM you're actually using is the RAM that your application needs, not all the RAM that you needed to actually spin up the host OS that's running the containers. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to, I do want to get into Docker, but I want to, I want to have a 
prototypical example of platform as a service that we can discuss throughout this conversation. I think the perfect uh, example is OpenShift because you work at Red Hat and Red Hat's platform as a service product is OpenShift. So um, what is OpenShift? How, how does OpenShift, uh, like, how, do you, how would you define it uh, as compared to other platform as a service products? Okay, so OpenShift is in this interesting in-between phase. It's kind of like an awkward, it's not like an awkward team phase, but I can't think of any other awkward phase analogy to use. Um, we actually have been running for almost five years now. Um, the first iteration of OpenShift, so where we had it online and everything, we were using our own containers, not Docker containers. And basically what it allowed you to do is to take your source code, say you want these packages, spin up a container, and then just run it. And we had that hosted and online, which now has over 2 million applications that have been spun up, you know, hundreds of thousands of users that have used it. And we also have an enterprise version where just like there's um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, there's also OpenShift Enterprise, where a company could pay also for the software and put it on their own mach machines and run the platform as a service themselves. And of course, since we're Red Hat, there's also an open source version, which is OpenShift Origin. And that's where all of our work actually takes place is in OpenShift Origin. It's in GitHub under um, OpenShift slash Origin. Those are, that's our GitHub repo for it. And that's where all the upstream work takes place. Um, and that you can also install and run anywhere you want. You just can't call in for support and you don't get the nice installers and all that stuff. Hmm. Right. So we have actual companies who've taken OpenShift Origin, like GetUp Cloud in um, Brazil, where they said, hey, there's no good real PaaS hosting in Brazil right now. We're going to take OpenShift Origin, stand that up and run that in Brazil. Hmm. Right. And so that was the original version where we used our own gears and our own cartridges. Then last year at about June, we released our new version, which is now using Docker as our containers. Then it uses Kubernetes as the orchestration layer, right? So these are two very large other open source projects. And then we're putting stuff on top to make it easier for developers to use and easier for sysadmins to use, mm. right? And we're actually also working upstream with both Docker and Kubernetes to push features there as well. Mm. Our goal with this is to make it so that anybody running a Kubernetes cluster gets the same. We don't want people to think that they're the Red Hat Kubernetes is somehow different from everybody else's Kubernetes. So if there's something we want in the base layer, we push that up. So we've replaced a lot of the guts that we had in our old version with Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And so Kubernetes is an open source platform from Google that allows for the orchestration. So this is why, so it was a long way of me getting to, um, you know, there's some on my team who say that platform as a service has kind of passed and now we're a container application platform. Right. So I think right now we are the we're out in front of allowing you to take Docker containers and then run them in production on your own machine or run them in our we have a dedicated instance where you can pay us and we'll spin it up an OpenShift cluster and any Amazon or Google compute engine. Um, and that'll be yours and you can run it. And then by this summer sometime, we'll have the public version again like we had before. So the idea with OpenShift and that's another longer way to get to. Oh, what you would do with OpenShift now is dev with your Docker containers. You can either do that in OpenShift or wherever you want, and then you can take those and then run them for real in, um, in OpenShift, right? Without having to have the expertise of how to stand up a Kubernetes cluster and maintain it, or a Mesosphere cluster, or a Docker Swarm cluster. It's actually more focused on that separation again, where devs just say, I have a Docker image, and sysadmins say, oh, well, I'll set up the cluster for you, and then we'll, we'll run it all together. And then it gives you all sorts of advantages like failover and scaling and all sorts of other really fun stuff. Mm. Does, that, does that get at your answer? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I want to I simplify a little bit and kind of roll back to the just a base level conversation for why Docker is so useful to a platform as a service. Um, <clears throat> I, I know you've touched on a lot of that um, at a higher level, but just... For some people who aren't as familiar with with the movie, they haven't worked directly with platform as service. They haven't worked directly with Docker. So, you know, just talking at base level theoretical terms, why is Docker useful for a platform as a service like OpenShift? Okay, can I also can I also talk a little about why it's useful for devs 
Is that okay as well? Absolutely. Please. Okay. So the, here's the thing. So for a long time, the base, the usual way that we develop, deliver things was either a tarball, right, of all the source code, or maybe if you were more advanced, you might have an RPM or a Debian. I, I forget what, the, I know it's app get, but I don't remember what you're actually delivering with Debian. Yeah. But you're basically, you've taken some source, source code and you're laying it down. But then whoever gets that source code actually has to configure it to run on the platform. Right. And one of the things that Docker containers get around is they actually let you configure everything and let you deliver that it configured application wherever you want. It's very portable. You can just move that configured application around. The part where Docker <laughs> kind of falls down is when you move to production. So it's kind of like a V to me when I, as a developer, when Docker came out three years ago and I started playing with it because we knew that OpenShift was heading in that direction, I was like, well, Docker by itself, that's not much better than a VM, right? Like I've got all the stuff in it and it's all configured, but like, how do I actually run this in production? And I don't really want to configure all that stuff. And so, and how do I do networking? Like networking is particularly hard or storage with Docker is, is kind of tricky as well. So what's the nice part for a platform as a service or as a developer is you can actually take your packaged application that you've put into different Docker containers, and then you can deliver those pieces of the application to whomever and say, run this. And so what's nice for us as OpenShift is we've got these Docker containers. We can actually give you a Docker container and you can take your source code and put them together. And we know exactly how to run it. It's not like install this, install that, install this, then tweak this, then set this to this, then set that to that. You can just basically give the Docker container and run it. But the nice part is the developer has a way to run that Docker container on their local machine and play with it as well, hmm. right? So they can play with it. What I think one of the things that's kind of hard for developers, and this is where um, I think Docker has some work to do, is the local development experience for multi-tiered applications. It's fine if you do an application with a database and the web server in the same Docker container. But once you start having multiple Docker containers together, like, oh, I have a message queue and I have a cache and I have two web servers and I have two database servers and they're in replication and this is how they're all talking together, actually moving that, you might be able to set that up on your desktop, and it, but it would be tricky. And it wouldn't actually be very portable to moving that up to production. I mean, there's some products out now, OpenShift is one, but there's also like Docker Swarm. But Docker Swarm, again, I think is more geared towards sysadmins running containers in that way. So open what OpenShift is a way for you to actually write a configuration file and send the whole thing up and run it. And mm -hmm. we have a, we have a, one of the other nice things about the way it runs is we have an all-in-one VM which has the entire OpenShift platform in a VM. So you can download openshift.org slash VM. Uh, some engineers and I work on that. You can bring that down to your machine, spin it up using Vagrant, and then you can pretend that that's a cluster, do all of your specifications, spit out the JSON file. And as long as your production cluster can see those Docker images, you can just send the JSON file up to the production cluster and it spins up the exact same thing in the exact same way. Mm. So it's, it's a nice way to move the entire application around as opposed to individual Docker containers. Okay, fascinating. Engineers love automation, and Wealthfront automates your investing. As a software engineer, there are certain processes that you want to execute no matter what, like integration tests during a build. You wouldn't execute integration tests manually. You would use a continuous integration tool like CodeShip or Jenkins to automate your integration tests. Wealthfront is a tool to automate investing. Just like a continuous integration tool runs your tests automatically, Wealthfront can reinvest your dividends automatically and perform tax loss harvesting automatically. To get your first $15,000 managed by Wealthfront for free, go to Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily and get started with Wealthfront's layer of automation on top of your portfolio. Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily. Check it out. It would support Software Engineering Daily, and you will get $15,000 managed for free if you sign up. Automate your investing. Get back to the things that you can't automate, like writing code. So you've explained very eloquently how Docker gives us this layer of standardization that um, allows us to think in terms of these easy to use Docker containers rather than tarballs or like EXEs and 
um, strange configuration, strange unusual configuration files. Um, so now that we have the idea of of Docker being being how we are piecing together the applications that maybe a sysadmin is is configuring and uh, and and allowing the developers to deploy in a way that they have contractually kind of agreed upon. Give me an idea of of where Kubernetes fits in and how Kubernetes. Uh, w- w- what what does Kubernetes do within this relationship on this platform? Right. So Kubernetes is getting at solving that. How do you run Docker containers in production? Right. That's its main goal. What it does is there's a master. A couple. If you're in high availability, you have a couple of master machines. And that's where some of the infrastructure sits. And then you have a bunch of nodes, which are going to actually run your Docker containers. And what Kubernetes takes care of in that cluster is orchestration. So like, how do, the, how do I spin up different ones? How do I spin up different pods in different places, right? Scheduling, where do I schedule to spin up those different, sorry, pods, I said. It's pods are a type, are a container for Docker containers. It's turtles all the way down in Kubernetes. <laughs> it's containers and containers and containers. And so um, a pod is one or more Docker containers that need to run together Uh, and not in the sense of a web server and a database, but more like a database and a monitoring tool. Um, So the Kubernetes handles how those get put onto different nodes, how to make sure if one goes down, it'll spin it back up again, right? So they haven't built in all sorts of interesting features to run and orchestrate and isolate all the different Docker containers. So there's like network isolation between containers that are running because I don't want my containers to be visible to your containers, right? It also does things like resource allocation to the pods and making sure that quotas are met and all that, like enforcing quotas on containers and things like that. So it handles everything above the actual container. It takes containers and actually has a great way of running them. And then OpenShift layers on top of that because Kubernetes comes out of Google and it was built on the same thing. It's built by the same engineers that built Borg and Omega, which is what... Uh, Google uses internally to run containers. Anybody using Gmail is actually using um, a containerized service that's running at Google. Google spins up about 7,000 containers a second inside of Google. So everything that Google does is done with containers. Hmm. Um, And Kubernetes are an extra vision of that. And so what we've done is actually put things on top of Kubernetes, not forked anything in Kubernetes. It's a straight Kubernetes. Like if you wanted to use the Kubelet API against an OpenShift cluster, you could. And our JSON, so what, oh, that's right. So what, let me go back, (laughs) sorry. I keep getting ahead of myself. Um, Let me finish the OpenShift part and then I'll go back about why this is awesome. So OpenShift adds things like a software defined network layer. Kubernetes expects you to have a network layer that's like the Google compute engine or Google storage, right? So it has persistent storage. So we bring software defined networks. We bring a Ceph driver or a Gluster driver or an NFS driver that we push up into Kubernetes. Right. And then OpenShift brings things like um, Kubernetes is really just about containers. We add things on top of the containers that allows you to configure build pathways, like take this source code plus this Docker image and build this. And this and I, then it also like a deployment configuration, like watch this Docker registry whenever it changes, actually automatically deploy it. Do, and so we actually add stuff on top of that base layer to make it easier for assistants and developers. So. One of the things that's new with Kubernetes, it's not new uh, in the world, but it's new for us in OpenShift that I really love, is Kubernetes uses declarative configuration. So what I mean by that is we use, Kubernetes uses etcd to store the state of the world, right? And that etcd database is the truth, right? And then what's happening on all the nodes is they're always checking into etcd saying, hey, does the real world match the truth? If not, make the world match the truth. So what that means is I can take a JSON file that specifies which containers, which build pathways, what URLs to expose, all that stuff, put it into a JSON file, push that to OpenShift or Kubernetes, and the truth, that becomes the truth. And then the cluster checks in and says, hey, do we match that truth? No, make it so. So it just goes out there and starts doing all its work, spinning all that stuff up. It's not like like we have to go to each node and tell it what to do. The nodes all know to to check in and to make themselves like that, which is a very different model. And it makes it much easier for us to do things like scaling or telling you the work part you are in the build process, because there's all sorts of checking ins that happen between the nodes and the master. 
It's just mm-hmm. a much nicer way. And so what comes out at the end is that, like I said before, you can spit that truth back out, right, into a JSON file, and you could give that to your sysadmin. And as long as a sysadmin can see, this, see the same Docker registries, they can give that JSON file right back into their Kubernetes cluster or their project within the Kubernetes cluster and or OpenShift cluster, and it'll spin the exact same architecture up again because that becomes the truth there. And then the cluster will proceed to make the world like the truth. Mm. So I'd love to talk about this in more of a holistic practice sense. So, um, you know, we've kind of talked about how OpenShift works. We've talked at a high level about how it uh, improves the relationship between um, developers and sysadmins. Um, I'd love to put this in in a, a more concrete context. Um, so how would I use OpenShift? So if I'm like, let's say I'm some kind of e-commerce company and I've got, I, I want to use OpenShift uh, or some other paths, let's just say OpenShift, to build uh, like my microservices architecture for my e-commerce solution that has all these different things. It's got a shopping cart. It's got... Uh, you know, I've got to be able to like look through items. I've got to be able to display ads, all these different things that are composed with microservices. These microservices are, you know, running on these machines that have OpenShift. Why would I use OpenShift to build a microservices architecture? And and how would this affect the uh, the relationship between developers and sysadmins at this uh, theoretical company? Okay, so I... Using a platform for a service like this, at the very basic level, it allows for much faster experimentation, right? If, as long as there's a, an approved Docker image, or at, well, I mean, actually the sysadmins, if they really want, like living on the edge, they could say on the developer cluster, anything running in the Docker registry, you can run on OpenShift, right? So a dev can find an image that they really like on um, on Docker Hub, and they can use that as their base image that they just run in OpenShift. So that's ultimate experimentation. What we have found with most inside of most companies is, um, and this was a great example that I saw where how Docker helps is at least the companies I talk to, they're usually running RHEL, no surprise, right? Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So what they do though, is they say, hey, dev, go grab that Docker image that you like, try it out, see if you like it, but then give me the Docker file and I'll rebuild that exact same image just using RHEL as the base layer, the RHEL that comes from Red Hat so I know I can get all the fixes automatically. And then you can use that. I'll put that in a registry that you can use. And so then what they'll do is the devs can say, well, here's a Node one that I want. Here's a Ruby one that I want. Here's a Mongo. Here's a Couchbase. Here's all the different types I want. The sysadmins make those, put those in a registry, and then the devs can just play with them as they like. So when they're starting up a microservice, one of the things you have to decide is what's the right technology for that service. So they may say, oh, this should work fine in Java. And then they try to do some sort of performance stuff. And it turns out, oh, it would be really nice if we could do some sort of single threaded node model. It's very easy. No one has to make a new VM. No one has to do anything else like that. They can just destroy that old project and spin it up with node again, right? And then they can say, oh, and we want to talk, the database we want for the, let's say the search service, it, we need something that has really, really high throughput and caches really well. Let's use, um, let's use Cassandra. Or let's use memcache, because all we're doing is reading and we don't really care about writes. Let's do something like that, or membase. And so they can actually spin that up as a service and not have to worry about what any of the other team's doing, right? And they can keep iterating and then they can say, oh, we're ready, let's expose that URL to the other teams, right? And only the URL that they want to expose and then they can control it. And then inside of their project or their cluster, they can do whatever they want. So it makes it much easier for them to say, oh, well, we want Rabbit or we want ActiveMQ inside of ours. So we're gonna put that there. And then some of the other things is they may be doing something like a central authentication server. So the sysadmins can say, well, we're going to own that. So we're, don't, you guys don't get to own that, but we're going to have another OpenShift project and we'll spin up the central authentication server in that. And you guys all, here's the URL you guys hit against and you hit against it and we'll take care of that service there. Or a dev team can say, we are all the entire authentication service. We, you guys don't worry about it. We'll spin it up. And then you can have a centralized authentication server as well. So it's kind of a, a, a really nice way to orchestrate everything together, and but still giving people freedom to play with the things they want to play with, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, totally. And so I think that really helps with the microservices architecture because it's very easy to spin things up, try things out, um, change things if you need to change things, but also still keep things isolated in a repeatable way, 
mm-hmm. as opposed to we're all spinning up our VMs all the same way. So there's no system, there's no system, um, there's no gain internally about oh knowledge, right? Like oh, I have to go talk actually to those people who spin spin up Node, and they're spinning up Node a bit differently. How do we make that work? Oh, the sysadmins kind of don't know that way, but they know this way. If you use that more standardized model from a PaaS, everybody's spinning up Node this relatively the same way. And if somebody comes along a, with a great solution that they want to actually change the way Node runs, you can bake that into the Docker image and then have all the other Node, all the other Node applications reboot based on that change to the Docker image, and everybody gets the advantage right there. Yep, totally. So, you know, the the shows that we've done about quote microservices, uh, one of the themes seems to be that it's it's oftentimes a company will implement microservices to improve the relations. Uh, within a company, it's not like you get some sort of crazy performance benefits or something out of it. It's more this this developer or DevOps harmony type of stuff. Um, but there are also, you know, the practical advantages of of having some uh, some atoms of scalability that you you know you've got these these smaller services and you can really pinpoint what aspects of your application you need to scale up or down um, during high or low traffic. So is OpenShift or a platform as a service in general useful for this type of uh, up up or down scaling under different circumstances of traffic? Yeah, so th- actually this is one of the things for reminding me. This, we actually do a lot with scaling. Um, and it turns out that OpenShift, this is one of the areas where we differentiate from a lot of the other platforms as a service. What OpenShift actually does is it allows you to scale the number of containers automatically based on the load coming into the application, right? So no, nobody, act, if you want to do, you don't have to, right? You don't have to, you can turn that off and you can manually scale, which is actually still quite easy. Like in the new version of OpenShift, there's actually even a web interface where you click an up arrow and it just spins up another container and that's it. Um, one caveat on that though is whatever container you're spinning up has to either be stateless so that it doesn't matter if the load balancer sends different connections to it or it understands what it means to scale up. So for example, the our partners at Crunchy Data Solutions, they've written a PostgreSQL container as lo- along with a bunch of a Kubernetes file that allows it to automatically scale up read replicas. So it starts up a master and a read replica right away. And then you can scale up read replicas as you're going along and it can actually automatically do that. So how that looks for OpenShift is what you, um, you can, in the new version, it's on CPU in the old version was on HTTP, but there'll be new version in the new version. There'll be more rules coming up, but right now, based on the amount of CPU being utilized inside a container, the platform as a service will actually, once it reaches a certain threshold, will actually spin up another container, put it behind the service layer, and then just start round robbing um, connections to it. And it, then when that load goes away, it'll actually spin it back down again. And so no one even has to be contacted. It'll just do it automatically. And I've got some videos that actually shows that on the web. Like I got a video about something called scale or fail, and it shows auto scaling a an application to handle an increase in traffic. I use BlazeMeter. It's a uh, it's JMeter as a service, and I basically throw a ton of work at my at my uh, either my individual application or my microservices, and then I watch it scale up or scale down. Ah, cool. I think that's one. We can one, put that in the show notes. Okay, and I think one of the other things about uh, those load testing services actually become even if you set it up internally and have your own service. One of the things that actually becomes much more important in terms of microservices, because in microservices, the only way you can exercise the entire application, like doing actual integration testing, is you're going to have to hit a whole bunch of different URLs and making sure it's actually behaving in the way you want. You don't have just one war file or one Python application or one Ruby application that you're just like, it's not like one Rails application and you just exercise those endpoints, you actually have to be sending URLs and posting JSON and accepting JSON and doing a whole bunch of other things. And so I think, you know, having some sort of integrated testing service makes that a lot better. Mm. And and I can keep going on about microservices for a while. And, you know, the point you made, though, about performance differences, I agree with you. I haven't, no, I've yet to meet anyone who says they do it for performance reasons. They do like the scaling reasons about being able to scale independently. But I think... 
you know, the, the more mature customers I meet with, it's exactly the reason you talked about, which is I don't care what I want to, I want all this bickering to stop about what technology we're using for what service, because one team can't agree with another team. <laughs> I want the teams to just own their service. And I also am tired of devs pointing at uh, production saying, well, it worked on my laptop. I don't care. You know, why isn't it working for you? They want more autonomy for their teams in terms of technology used, but also responsibility for when things go wrong and being able to be on the hook. And that's the team that's actually owning it. And I see the more mature companies saying that's the real reason we're using that. And I think more of the... Um, it, well, they actually want to go to the DevOps model. And going to a DevOps model is really hard when you're building a single war file that takes like three hours to build and then takes you know a couple weeks to test. That's just not acceptable. So they're actually moving to the microservices to also help with their DevOps transition as well. Yeah, the the monolith, you know, if you've got the the monolith in your software, uh, it's hard to have a model that is not uh pushing that monolith over a waterfall for every right. cycle. Exactly. Um, so you're giving a talk at Fluent 2016 called Containers and More to Get Your Service Running at the Scale You Need. What are you planning to cover in this talk? So in this talk, it's mostly going to be what I talked about here today. So I'm going to talk a, a very small bit about Docker. I think we were, we're far enough along in the evolution of Docker now that most people basically understand what it is. Then I'm going to show the Kubernetes and OpenShift um, object model, just a little bit of it, just so people understand the terms I'm using, like service, route, uh, persistent storage, uh, uh, what are this, some other, oh, build configs, all those kinds of things. And then the rest is going to be demoing an actual uh, application running on top of OpenShift, like the deployment model, how I can scale things up and down, how I can take things out of service, put them back into service just by changing labels. It'll mostly be showing people, because I think, you know, I think people appreciate seeing demos more than me just showing slideware most of the time. Hmm. So I'll actually just be showing a bunch of demos of my application doing a bunch of different things that are possible when you move to containers and something like Kubernetes and OpenShift. Hmm. Are there particular things that developers need to know about writing applications that scale on a container-based infrastructure, or do developers just get to continue thinking about developing their software? So I grew up in the age of monoliths, and I, you know, where you were pretty, you were great if you had a separate physical server for the web tier and a separate physical server for your database tier. You were like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. I'm totally high availability and I've got redundant power supplies and a RAID array in each of those. I'm great, right? And I, I think up until just recently, that's the way most people have been trained to think. Um, I think what developers need to stop thinking quite as much about is that being the architecture they prefer to deploy to. And that rather than thinking about vertical scaling, we're moving into a much more horizontally, horizontally scaling world where when load comes in, instead of calling up the uh, sysadmins and saying, hey, take that box down and put some more memory in it or add another CPU or upgrade the CPU, you actually think that, oh, I'm just going to add another container on the side. And so you need to start thinking about, you don't always have to do it. I hate making these huge broad statements because there are, like, I don't think everything should run in containers. I don't think everything should run on a PaaS. I don't think everything should be that way. But I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't learn about how to write your app applications so they horizontally scale, right? And I think one of the technologies that people may not have used as much before or may have used in a different way they may have, is uh, message queues. I think people maybe use those before as like an enterprise service bus, like at this big layer in big complicated applications. If you look at some of the younger developers or the developers who are starting to look at some of these newer horizontally scaling apps, they're building message queues in as a way to decouple the different pieces so that I can, nobody knows exactly who they're talking to. They just know they're talking to the message bus or the message queue. And so then there, that way it's, it's hard to do session state with a message queue, right? It's, it's much more complicated if you wanted to do something. You can, it's just much more complicated. You'd have to add in some big caching layer or session caching. Um, I think that's some of the things you actually, you don't have to write all your apps that way, especially if you're writing just someone little one-off, right? But if you're actually starting to write some real applications, it, 
would pay to start playing with them and to see patterns and how they feel and I don't know. That's about mm. what I think people need to start thinking about. So as as we get more and more people towards the DevOps model, uh, well, or as more people choose to, I don't want to talk about it like some sort of cult. Are there are there points of contention that could potentially arise? Like you know, we obviously think of it in terms of DevOps. You know, oh, it's it's harmonious, but it seems like if the developers are writing uh, their code as infrastructure and the operations team is writing their infrastructure as code, maybe there could be some potential conflict and overlap. So uh, maybe I'm wrong about this. If I am, please correct me. But if not, maybe you could give some best practices for how uh, dev and ops should sort of give uh, bounded uh, constraints for, for how they should manage their systems. You know, I think I can't give any global rules because, I mean, as much as I'd like to say uh, that there is a global rule, there's not a global rule for this. Uh, I think I, in the companies that I've seen that are doing this well, the biggest thing that they've done is broken down the boundary between developers and operations teams. And I think that's what some people talk about with the no-ops model, right? Some people are even talking about now about no-ops. Uh, I think Amazon... Uh, Netflix is moving to a no ops model where everybody's an ops person. And uh, the part, the problem with saying that is that's very threatening to operations people. And I don't think it actually means that they go away. I just think that it's the, their place in the chain or their place in the team, actually not even the chain, their place in the team is shifting from being separate to actually being part of it. And they may actually be even writing a little bit more application code, but they, uh, I think a model you're going to have operations people around for a very long time to come. I don't see that being able to be totally customizable. I think when you're implementing the DevOps model, the most important thing, though, is having a team and letting that team work together to figure out what's right for them. Uh, like if you look at something like Etsy, they have, I saw Rafe Coburn, I don't know if he's still at Etsy, but when he gave a talk at um, Oktoberfest a while ago, they had instrumented their entire deployment flow and their infrastructure so well and automated it so well that um, within, I think it's the first two weeks, a new dev is expected to push to production, like hmm. make a code change and put to production in the first two weeks. So that's a lot of trust all the way around. I think the trust and working together as a team is a huge part of that. Uh, I, I've heard Adrian Coburn, Coburn and uh, others talk about this. If you don't change your organizational model, both microservices and DevOps will fail. If you don't actually change the way you organize people and the way they relate to each other, no amount of technology or new pattern is actually going to work. You're just actually trying to force. It's just going to fail. I mean, if you don't put those people together, it's just going to fail if they're not a team. Mm -hmm. um, there is something else that you about tension points. I, I don't know. I, I think it's on a company by company basis, there, <clears throat> especially as you take a larger enterprise company with traditional roles and you try to move that forward, I mean, I think you could see uh, tension from the security team, right? Because they're usually, they have very different concerns from the ops and the and the dev team, right? And then enterprise architects, they usually have different concerns as well. It's a very large cultural change to move to DevOps and microservices. And I think the cultural part is actually the hardest part. And mm. part of working that cultural part out is removing those tension points that you're talking about. Mm. Is that, I don't know if that helps or not. No, 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 it's perfect. Where does testing fit into this conversation? How does, uh, you know, what what is what does a testing organization look like um, on 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 PaaS, and uh, and how do the responsibilities of developers and operations get defined uh, in terms of testing? So again, I think it depends on the company. Some companies, when they have a PaaS, will actually do, like I said, with DreamWorks, where they'll have a separate QA team and they clone the developer's application and they do it through QA testing. Other companies, they may say the testers are actually in the same team and they're testing the application continuously while it's being deployed on the PaaS, right? Actually, they're working and testing because the developer can each have their own individual little project, which they're pushing into the, you can merge them back up into the main project if you want as well. And QA can be actually just testing against the main project that the developers are pushing to as well. 
it can fit in into lots of different models. QA doesn't go away. It's probably in a microservices though, I would imagine the QA would actually be part of uh, part of a microservices team. You don't want that being bolted on afterwards. You actually want it, just like you want a sysadmin in there, just like you want a DBA in your team. You also probably want a QA person in your team helping to, and so that everybody's a QA person at least at some level, and you're actually doing the right kind of QA expert, uh, um, QA operations that someone with QA expertise actually brings. Mm -hmm. So. So we want to close off uh, just kind of a broad question. Wh where is this going? What is the future of platform as a service? That's a, that's a good one. I, you know, the, <laughs> if you had asked me that, you know, it, even if you went six years back and said, is there such a thing as a platform as a service? The, it, there wasn't much of one back then. It was really nascent and everybody was saying, oh yeah, it won't capture March market share and it won't be used very much. And now... I know we as Red Hat, we have our customers coming to us and saying, you know, I need this feature and I need that feature. And when, like that part of the reason why we moved to Docker last year is because all of our, cut uh, not all, a large percentage of our customers were coming to the OpenShift team and saying, when are you guys moving to Docker? When are you moving to Docker? Mm -hmm. So I think the landscape has changed uh, in terms of what people are expecting. I, I think in the near future, I think it's going to be standard at most companies or most places that there will be some sort of paths like infrastructure setup. I mean, I think personally it's all going to be open shift, but um, in reality, it'll probably be some mixture of our paths, other paths, either online or something that they bring in-house and then some homegrown ones. Like I've seen a lot of homegrown, uh, com a homegrown, has like things using Ansible and Puppet and Docker and Jenkins and this whole thing that they're rigging together. I think more of those will tend to go away in the same for the same reason that AWS has become so incredibly popular, which is a lot of companies realize, you know what, running our own hardware is actually not what we want to focus our energy on. We'll let Amazon do that and we'll pay for it. And we'll even pay a little bit of a premium because it's just not something we want to focus on. And I think building homegrown platforms as a service will be another one of those things that tend to die away as the larger players become more popular and well-known. And then, you know, I think we're at a time of container explosion. Um, I think VMs did a very nice job opening up the world to accept containers because once people thought of, oh, I don't need a physical machine, they became more open to different ways of slicing up a machine. And now I think with Docker and some of the other effort that's going on around containers, I see a lot of things happening in the container space that we hadn't seen before. I think it's one of those sea changes in terms of how things are built and deployed. I know Red Hat's all in on containers. Um, our team, we have a lot of contributors to the Docker project. And I know that we're now starting to also offer containerized versions of a lot of the software packages. We have Atomic OS, which is basically like the kernel, journal D, system D, just real low level functions and everything else you wanna bring, you bring as a container. Because mm -hmm. some of our customers are saying, yeah, yeah, we don't have servers that, we don't need um, postfix on a server that's not doing email, right? Or we are, this is an email server, but we wanna actually run two different versions of postfix for two different sets of people, and we don't wanna get into RPM conflicts. We can do that with containers, right? So you can be much more efficient and more focused using containers, and I think you'll see more and more um, enterprises and small companies just using containers in general. Mm. So it's just this question just came to mind, but um, you know, so we we basically moved from you know the the days of, of virtualization to containers, um, or the focus was on virtual. I mean, now we're now we're slicing up the VMs into containers. Yeah. Um, so you know, we've talked about this at the level of like software efficiency, but I'm also curious from an economic standpoint. Do, are there a lot of cost savings associated with moving to containerized infrastructure? Um, it, since I, yeah, yeah, there are. Uh, I was going to make some joke about VMware being very sad about containers coming out. Um, I think, you know, I still think VMs make sense for certain kinds of applications. I don't want to say that VMs have gone away. And we actually see people putting containers into VMs all over the place, right? We're not seeing a lot. We see some containers on bare metal. But we're also seeing a lot of containers inside of VMs for lots of reasons, like security reasons or slicing reasons, reliability reasons. Um, 
But I do think there a lot of things that people had used VMs for in the past are now getting done through containers. So I think because you're not paying a VM license, uh, unless you're using something like the open source versions of Zen or Libvirt or something like that, you're paying for every VM you spin up. And so if you have better ways of getting more efficiency out of your VMs without paying anything extra for it, most people are going to jump on that. Um, even with the, even when we were running our own containers before and op- the other version of OpenShift, we would say that people should, we're going to give you more efficiency no matter what, because it's impossible for most companies to get, unless they're doing like high performance computing, to get their VMs that they give to developers to be running white hot anyway, right? Like you, buy, you get a VM and yes, you can get your server to get a little bit hotter because you've put VMs on top of it. Like you're getting more efficient utilization of that server, but you still can't really push the VM as all those VMs as dense and as hot enough so that you're getting your maximum value out of that physical machine that you bought. Mm -hmm. So containers actually allow you to pack much more compute into that same machine or use it more efficiently. You're not getting more performance. It's just you're using the performance you have more efficiently using containers because you can pack more into it because each container that spins up isn't spinning up an entire VM, right? And not an entire OS. So you can get things in there much more dense and you can over provision, you can over provision because not all containers are running at the exact same time. Like it says, oh yes, I need 512 megs of RAM, but it doesn't need that all the time. So you can actually usually end up over provisioning and depending on how workload shifts around, you can get like a 10 to 20% over provision on that. Wow. And then actually one of the things we used to do with the old version of OpenShift that we'll be bringing to the new version of OpenShift as well, actually it'll probably come, probably we'll probably be pushing it upstream into Kubernetes, is the ability to idle a container. So in the version of, uh, the one that's running in online now, which we call version two, um, we had the ability that if there were no HTTP connections for 24 hours, we could actually serialize the entire container to disk. And so it stops using RAM, it stops using CPU, it's just using the disk space that it needs. And then the next connection that comes in, we could spin the container back up again and then start serving it up. So that first user who came back in, they might have to wait a little while while that container spun up. And by a little while, I mean under a minute, even in a Java application usually. And then that would spin back up and then it would start, you could start serving it up again and it would stay up again for 24 hours as long as there were still HTTP connections to it. So this allows a lot more over provisioning because developers in their excitement about new and, oh, I got to try out Rust now and I got to try out Erlang and I got to, and so they go to their system and they're like, I need you to build me a VM for this and I need it by Friday at five o'clock because I'm going to go. And so the sysadmins are working really hard on it. They give it to the, the developer. The developer works a little bit on it, then forgets about it and never gives the VM back. Here, it doesn't matter if you give them the VM or the container because it'll actually just idle down to disk if no one's using it. Hmm. And so you don't actually have to worry about it sitting there um, eating up a bunch of resources. Well, that sounds like a great place to stop. Uh, Steve, this is a super interesting conversation. Thanks for coming on to Software Engineering Daily and talking about OpenShift and Red Hat and containers and everything else that we discussed. I appreciate the conversation. Thanks so much. So, uh, I hope it was helpful and I really appreciated the time. Yeah, super helpful. And I'll see you at Fluent. I'll have a t-shirt for you. Awesome. Thanks. I'll have one for you, too. I'll bring you a t-shirt as well. Oh, fantastic. All right. right. I'll talk to you then. Okay, bye. Bye.